do you storyboard your movies? Do you no? no? Because they seem so controlled and so thought out. At the same time, they're so loose that it's like you can't. It's almost like they just flow out of you. Uh, when it comes to the last two movies, the, they were not storyboarded, but there, there's sometimes, I don't know, in your case, if you do drawings before, or you have concepts of how you're going to do the camera. I don't, I don't do the lighting at all. It's Benoit Deby, who's a, who's a genius, who, who did the lighting for my last two movies. But um, I do the camera work, and I just know how... The, sometimes I know how the, the, the scene before ended, or how the next one is going to start, so I just think of how I'm going to link the two scenes. Mm -hmm. But that's my only... I would say... My only, like... Uh, Say a graphic target is to have a nice cut from one scene to, to another, and inside you can do whatever. And if it can be a master shot, you do a master shot. But um, how are you going to match the, the last image of the, like that the, scene with the, the first one? The, of the, the, the transition, the transition between yeah. two scenes. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like that's the most important thing yeah. because. And usually you improvise it at the last moment, thinking, and so, so it's like, like a puzzle. You know uh, which ones you put, or you're trying to find the other form that's going to fit inside the. The piece of the puzzle that was next to it. And have you ever done something where you feel, ah, that was a mistake? Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like but if it, no, but uh, sometimes, hopefully, uh, you can reshoot. <laughs> <laughs> Not this whole scene, but you can reshoot the link that makes it better. Have you done that a lot? Yeah. <laughs> like what? All the time. Uh, I know, for example, for Enter the Void, we shot the whole movie in Japan. Then we went to shoot in Montreal, the scenes that were supposed to take place in the States. And then, after I did the first edit of the movie, I went back to Japan to shoot an additional week. And I came back, and then uh, I re-edited, and I still wanted to go there. Maybe I had, it was an excuse to go meet my friends and party. Right? So, so I have, we have to shoot three more days, and I went. But, and the, 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 the crew went from like 100 people to, to the, the retakes were just 25. And the last week, we were just five of them. <laughs> So yeah, that's a good experience. Yeah, it's a good experience. <laughs> Do you have fun on your movies? Uh, I find them very stressful <laughs> to make. Because <Huh>? I'm... <laughs> in Thailand you didn't seem very stressful. No, it's... Um, it's... Because we always fight for time. You know, you always... I mean, I've never had more than seven weeks to shoot a whole movie, max. And even on a movie like Drive, where we had three car chases. Um, you only had two days per car chase, so, and, and they're very boring, car chases are very boring to shoot because it's all about safety when you shoot them and what you can and cannot do. And there's a lot of speeches in the beginning from the stunt people and a lot of security and then, you know, you have one take, you know, and um, for example, um, on the second car chase in Drive when they're robbing the bank, and Ryan is driving away with Christina uh, Hendricks. Um, I had one take for the car to smash that's chasing them. And um, which means that I could shoot it once and we didn't have money to go back and do it again or do a retake. And so you're meeting with the stunt people and all the stunt people are like, saying that they're gonna make this incredible thing. And I go, well, um, I would like the car, you know, to, to, to jump up or something like that, to really smash into somewhere. And uh, so they showed me a real life car accident where the car would hit one part of the road and then it would fly over the other end of the road. I said, great, can we do that? They're like, absolutely. Uh, so they come up with all these machinery and all these things and then the car has to you know, hit this mark and then it'll fly. And uh, everything is set up and um, we only have two cameras and then, um, but I needed more. So we took some of those D5 small cameras, which are not very good quality, just to place around. And then by just chance, I said, let's just put a camera inside on Christina as well, just to get her reactions. But we had all the cameras set out outside for the big crash. And then we said, okay, action. And then they drove and then the car hit this machinery that was supposed to make it fly all the way across the road and hit the other end of the road and it was going to be really spectacular 
but all that happened was that the car hit the machine and went up and went down. And that was it. So it was nothing. So all this car chase that was going to end with this spectacular crash that I had promised everyone just was nothing. But then, by luck, uh, the camera on Christina inside the car captured the car just flying up a little bit, but her reaction was the whole scene. So it was one of the things by chance, you know, it was Michael Bay who had just gone back and reshot it 27 times, but we don't have that kind of money. That was, uh, but I find making films very stressful. I don't, I don't enjoy the process very much. Meaning that I like when it works, but I am always anxious that it's not working. Do you know that feeling? I get stressed during the pre-production. Usually. The pre is easy. The, the, the pre no, the, the, oh, I love you because you, know, you can just talk and plan. plan. It's going to be great. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> but I agree with the idea that sometimes the things that happen by chance, like in um, in in. Um, especially in, in the movie about Hall Rising. Mm. Actually in Bronson, which was like the first Fourier into like another language. I used to do like documentary kind of films, as you know, but now I started making more hyper realism. And in Bronson, um, um, you know, I ended up with Tom Hardy, but I, that one I shot about 60% while we shot it, went back and reshot and reshot. And I like that process to refine it. But that was because it was only one actor and it was fairly easy to do. But the biggest kind of idea probably came in Drive because um, that whole elevator sequence is something I made up in while we were trying to figure out something else. And uh, then I remember I had seen Irreversible and I said, we got to have a head smashing. And that's how we met. <laughs> we met because I called Gaspar and I said, how did you do that head smash? <laughs> And um, I don't think mine is as good as yours. Well, yours is longer, but I got Ryan in mine. You know, <laughs> you don't. And I, there's also a kiss between a man and a woman. But the whole idea was that ha that I think was when you improvise and it works. That to me is when it, you feel that you are enjoying what you're making. Also, I don't know if you have the this feeling that you have a lucky star that things are gonna. You arrange on the way to your target that you know, the solution is going to come at the very last moment. Mm -hmm. Mostly, if you believe in, you get more often than there are people who don't believe in their lucky star. But sometimes you know the light doesn't strike you at the last moment. You're just there, and, and uh, I am, um, for example, on Irreversible, I wanted to have a scene with Vincent and Monica having sex or pretending to have sex that would come at the end of the movie. Um, so, like, you would see that what, like, loving full sex could be compared to the rape scene and was so to, to make the difference. But uh, because before that I proposed them a movie that was very erotic and they turned it, turned it down, they said, oh, no, no, but we can do whatever you want, but we will not do an erotic movie. I said, no, just one scene. No, no, no. It's a bad so I thought I shoot the whole movie. And once we're done with the whole movie, just after that uh, scene with, um, even with the... Um, with the uh, flip down, I thought I could come back and convince them to do the scene of them kissing and pretending to have like a happy orgasm. The, and then they told me, no, 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 that's our private life. We get stalkers all the time. We don't want to share that privacy with other people. I could understand it, but still, I said it would be so good for the movie. So um, I came again. Uh, Vincent said no. I would try it with Monica. She said no. Well, Vincent said no. Blah, blah, blah. But they said, but if you want to shoot it with some other people, just do it. I said, well, what do you mean? Yeah, you just hire body doubles and you do the scene. He said, well, but it was mostly about your faces, not, not about the, the, the rest. And so they said, they proposed it. Okay, so I called the producer. I said, well, I, I want to hire like a, a porn couple. <laughs> to make that love scene, but I said, oh, but it's not exactly that I didn't want to frame the bodies, I wanted to frame the faces, but I'll, I'll try to And actually, so I heard, and I did a porn scene with it. It was hard to find a girl who looked like Monica and also who had a pubic hair that was not shaven. And then we showed it, and then I saw the images. They were so pornographic, but in the cheap way that, that it was like more disgusting than, than all the rest of the movie. <laughs> so I ended up with 
putting that in would destroy the movie. So actually, I said, no, let's just go from the bad scene where the, the post sex scene that, that they had done to the, to the epilogue. But that scene that was supposed to be a climax finally never. It's not in the movie. Uh, Sometimes the I miss it when, when, when each time I see the movie, I say, no, it would have been good. But no, even like in the, in the in, um, Straw Dogs, there's a rape scene and you see just the face of the girl being raped. I thought I could do that just with the, the faces, or maybe I would. And uh, that was mostly that they didn't want to share their uh, like what's it? private life. No, yeah, I could understand, but maybe that's one, re one regret I have. <laughs> that's the only regret. <laughs> what was the scene that you regret it's not in one of your movies? Um, I think I, reg I regret a whole movie, uh, just not one scene. Um, but otherwise, up until now, I've felt pretty lucky. But I'm struck, I'm, I'm working on a movie now that's very uh, challenging, and I've painted myself into a corner trying to you know, structure it, and um, it's exciting because you also feel that everything is falling apart, but that's what makes it interesting. I think that um, there's never been one scene that I was like, God, I wish I, wish I could have done that um, as of yet. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, no. <laughs> I don't have any of those regrets. Like for example, when you prepare uh, your next movie, do you know how you're gonna frame it, cover the scene, or edit it, or is it just things that you decide at the last moment? Uh, well, like you, I shoot in chronologically order, you know? So no, I just is for irreversible, but not for... Not for the divorce? No, no, no. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I mean, I shoot in chronologically order because I was like, I get confused. Um, and, uh, and, and I like the idea that you can just go along as it progresses, you know, but it's because I, I've been using Tarot a lot lately to, for the movies. So I go to Aliendo Jodorowsky's house and he gives me Tarot readings <laughs> on what I should do or not do, you know, on the, on the images as well. And uh, uh, it's very interesting to sit there because he sometimes says things that are very right, you know. Um, but I think that um, I, I, get ups I have these certain elements that I need to figure out a way to put into the movie. And that's going to change the whole story. So, like yourself, it's all about what I like to see and not what I want to understand or what I want to, um, you know the story to be, the story always, always becomes the secondary element for me, which I've been criticized for, but so is, have you, I know, but how do you feel about that? I remember close friends after this went through the voice said, you know the problem in your movies, the script, like the guy dies at the beginning of the story, and then after the flashback, it's just a ghost, there's no story, there's no, no main character, you really need some professional Screenwriter to work <laughs> and I would say, and I would always answer, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> because I, I actually wanted to escape from that you know, professional kind, well, we kind of it. writing. Yeah. But how do you? I mean, what, what, what would people? How do you sell your movies? I don't sell them. Vincent makes it. Okay. <laughs> Vincent Maravall is my producer. I don't know how he sold it or he didn't sell it. Yeah, but I mean, how do you, I mean, how would, I have to sell my own. I know, you go, you, you, you go to foreign countries. And you promise them stuff. No, you have drinks, you party, yeah. you do <laughs> I don't know, is it, that is selling. If you, don't, if you don't go, people will blame you. And so as you have to go, you enjoy the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you had to actually get something by selling something? When I met you in Cannes, you were setting this other project. Yes. Like we met two weeks ago in Cannes. He's producing a movie. So he was telling this, all these foreign distributors, uh, the, the, the white bunch organized the dinner. That was with interesting. The whole, uh, with like 40 people, like blah, 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 blah. He was talking to everybody how good the movie was going to be and whatever. 
And he made a great job. It was like a one-man show that lasted for 40 minutes. It was a great... And then he was talking personally to each, each distributor. I don't know how many, much money was found that night, but they did the same thing for my erotic project with Vincent. Is that the one you showed me? Yeah, yeah, definitely. The four images? Yeah, so they, they asked me, okay. can you do like quick posters for, for to sell the movie? So we did posters one week before. And what was, can you tell what they were? Uh, yeah, that was like close ups of whatever, lips, asses, penises, whatever. <laughs> it's called love, but it, it's very graphic, it's very pretty. And um, because the movie is going to be explicit, and um, <laughs> and so they, they put the posters and invited all these foreign distributors, and I was also like setting the movie, but it was funny. So they, there was like a big lunch and all these people around. They were asking me questions, but it's that is setting. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but do you ever find? I mean, the movies that we, you know, I always find the problem is that you have to promise people something because they want, you know, what are they going to get? I mean, when you for example did Irreversible, how did you, how did you, how did you sell that? Um, how did I sell? Uh, actually, the um, Monica had just done before that the biggest blockbuster of the French cinema at the time was Asterix number two. <laughs> <laughs> so she, and also when people would vote, you know, for who is the prettiest French woman who could represent the, the, the Marianne, the head of France. They would say Monica Bellucci, although she's Italian. So she was like number one in France in, like the, in the, the audience desire. And, uh, and Vincent was very, very popular, and the third guy was a comedian. So uh, actually the movie was sold to Studio Canal and to other people just by name dropping. There was no script, there was no title, there were just like three names plus mine. And I said, well, let's do a rape and revenge movie told backwards. And they said, oh, yeah, well, because he's Monica. Vincent. They, they, they thought it was like having Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise doing Taxi Driver, uh, sex scenes, whatever. And actually, maybe we kind of got close to something like that, but in a, in a weird way. But uh, it was not a big budget, but uh, it was mainly by name dropping. I came from my first movie with actors that no one knew, that mostly they were non-professional. Actors, they were not just people from the from the street besides Philippe, and um, and then I understood how Godard could finance his uncommercial movies. You just put the biggest stars of the moment, and it's magic. That the money appears, and you promise them entertainment. Yeah, and also if you have, you promise that uh, yeah, uh, maybe uh, before doing a vertical. Uh, Tarantino's movies were very successful, you know, the, the Reservoir Dogs, and so they saw this was going to be like a cool, violent movie. And the movie's not always cool, but uh, it's still very graphic. Mm -hmm. so I did uh, once... For, 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 for Enter the Void, I yeah. know that uh, I, I lied a lot. I said it was going to be a, like a mix of Train Spotting 2001 <laughs> and No Time to Drive, and it was going to maybe better than the three of them together. <laughs> and that was in the, you know, in, in the director's note at the beginning you of the script. Oh, yeah. Mostly people don't read the script, they just read the director's note, but uh, I was telling that, 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 that this is a movie that everybody is expecting that contains all the, the, the humor of Train Spotting. And, uh, mm -hmm. But it's also. <laughs> <laughs> Once when, 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 when you have the camera, once you have the crew, then you, you do your movie then. Well, it's, I remember when we were at, at the Cannes party because, uh, um, I mean, because when we make the kind of movies we make, uh, our scripts are usually very difficult, to, to, if there is a script, you know. And um, I remember on Valhalla Rising, I just said that Vikings and Mats Mikkelsen, it was going to be a really good action movie. <laughs> And of course, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> it's a great action. <laughs> you think, but um, but it's the idea of use. But I at Cannes this year with my next film, uh, so all the distributors were there, and I didn't. I wasn't finished with the script, and I didn't want to tell them anything. So I just told them that I was going to make it really cheap, and everybody said, "Yeah," <laughs> <laughs> and that was that. But in terms of like, do you have like a specifically approach when you sit down? and say, I want to make my next movie. Uh, for example, for the next movie, there's a kind of movie I would dream to see on the screen. 
But I haven't seen so so someone has to do the job. <laughs> sacrifice myself but it's not so much about enjoying the process of making it it's mostly about you want to see the results on the screen mm -hmm. but when a lot of people ask you like your, your visual references or you how you get your inspirations i find it very difficult to answer because sometimes it's... there are so many references right. this is not, not one some movies get closer to one reference but um yeah you also it's like a you don't prefer the same salad every night. Mm. One day you put tomatoes, and one day you put a, a bad taste. Like the mix of different things that you like in real life or your own obsessions, and the salad, so the salad always tastes a bit different. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to get movies made this way. I mean, how do you feel about the future of this kind of thing? Um, I've been lucky. Uh, I was not lucky when I did my first feature, but since um, I did the reversible. I was working with Vincent Maraval, and it's very important to have people who follow you very intelligent and who have the same uh, goal than you when it comes to what's going to be on the screen. Vincent Maraval from Wild Punch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That also worked with you on the Battle Rising, and mm -hmm. they didn't like it. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I, I know he, he liked it, but then he saw it was not going to be the commercial blockbuster. I promised him. That's promised him. <laughs> but he yeah, had the same issue with Enter the Void, but at the same time, it's a great movie. But uh, Also because he sells it to the other people inside the company. So oh, this is... Uh, this is going to make big time. This is going to make... Uh, and then when they lose money, he was responsible for convincing his partner. Uh, well, I've always been told that all the films I make wouldn't make any money, including Drive. Uh, Drive was extremely successful, extremely, in France. Yes, but everybody thought it was going to be a disaster. So much that they that the um, people wanted their names off the movie, <laughs> and then when the movie premiered, everybody wanted their names back on again. <laughs> but I find it very hard to when Kim asked me um, to say, "How do you talk about your vi your visual?" Because it's 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 like, how do you breathe? I I don't, I mean, I don't really have a a, a way, but I thought maybe sometimes seeing your movies, because I think that I just said you were my favorite film director in France. And, uh, and, um, but it's, it's because I don't see, you know, watching your movies reminds me of like watching Vampire by Dreyer or things like that, that it goes all the way back to the pure origin of film, where it's really all about an image and a piece of music and an emotion and not about constructions or actors or distribution that eventually will come down the line for us. But the idea that, and I'm very envious of you for having that talent, you know. So sometimes I think you maybe also have some common references like Kenneth Sanger. Sanger is the best. And when it comes to, you know, to what's a good psychedelic movie, the integration of the pleasure zone, uh, it's one of, uh, if it's not top on the list, it's one of the, the biggest psychedelic movies ever done. That's also like a political movie. And, and I know that I, when I was doing Enter the Void, I was in my head, I, I said, well, can I do something that gets close to that, like, colorful world? And maybe you had that, also that reference. At the I same time, you realize. Yeah. Well, in, 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 in aggravation of a pleasure, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, that there, are, there are directors that you admire also for the, 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 the because they're different from the others because they're radical or uh, the or the being that themselves. Uh, I don't think there was anybody like Ken Sanger before Ken Sanger. Uh, there are some. Uh, yesterday um, I was watching a movie, and I didn't remember it was so good. It's the um, the Boston Strangler. Richard Fleischer. The Richard Fleischer with all these split screens. And that, that movie is one of its kind. I'd never seen a movie with all these like images inside the image. And we said, well, the guy invented a whole uh, uh, system of editing that has never been redone since. And it was amazing. It was incredible. He did it like, a, like an art movie. So basically, your inspiration is just very basic. You watch other movies and then you come up with ideas. You don't go to paint, you don't go to museums and 
read Dostoevsky and, and, and have all these long philosophical reasons why you do what you do, you just purely do it as impulse. Yeah. yeah. Like a little bit, but, but mostly, I, I consume, I don't know about you, I don't go to museums that much, not because I don't like the paintings, mostly because there's so many people inside the museums that you get annoyed by the people, you don't have like a, like a personal link to, 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 to the work. Why, when you're watching a DVD at your place or you're in cinema, it's um, um, almost like a more personal um, dialogue that you have with the screen? I try to watch every movie now on an iPhone. <laughs> no, because I think it's where the future is going to be. Yeah. My name is Shish, the guy who distributes your movies on DVD in, in France and also theatrically. He was telling me that Blu-ray was not working in France because now the kids that mostly used to buy the DVDs now they, they want to see everything on their iPad or, or their iPhone. And say so they, 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 they don't want a better quality. They go for lower quality. They just want to consume immediately. And if they can bootleg it or they can, uh, the, the sooner the better, it's more about the timing. Uh, you want to have it right now and you don't care about the quality of things. I like that. I mean, I think that's interesting. And that's why I try to watch everything on my iPhone because it will give you an idea of how you, I mean, I mean, do you go? I never go to the cinema anymore. Do you? I mean, I had to at Cannes because I, 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 I like what you mean in cinema, the ones you care about because the sound is so much better. It's not so much about the image. You can always turn off the, the lights at your house or, or watch it on, on a very small screen, but the sound makes a difference. I mean, I, I'm totally, I think that the digital world is, I mean, you know, most movies are seen in 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 um, in, um, in, a, in a digital form anyway. So I think that we might as well embrace the fact that we have to watch a movie but with an iPhone. <laughs> I know, for example, I, I did a very short film uh, lately that I finished it last week, and we mix it in the, in the sound mix studio. And the sound was great. And then I said, well, please, before I give it to the people I was supposed to give it to, can we just check how it sounds and how it looks on the iPhone? And all the sound effects that we had put would disappear. The, the lower frequencies, the higher frequencies, and like everything that was in the middle. Uh, the only thing you could hear was like the medium sounds, and there was nothing there, so the high pitched sounds and the lower, the low pitched sounds would disappear. And we had to remix the whole scene, putting a lot in, in the middle. But they could come up with a new app. That you can download for your iPhone. That yeah. will change that. 